I just came off a week of vacation, so I'm not firing perfectly. We were fishing up in Minnesota, so a lot of people have asked, are we going to get fish stories today? Well, my sermon's on lying and deception, so I can't uh, tell you any fishing stories whatsoever. I didn't catch much other than a cold, so I got a very white voice going on right now, so I can get down real low. This um, passage of Scripture is, is just one that is kind of crazy. I mean, we have these images of these Old Testament patriarchs being these strong men of faith and, and uh, devotion to God and, and setting an example for all of us. But if you really peel this back, you discover that Jacob really is a dark horse. In other words, you look at him on the outside, and this guy is nothing admirable about him, really, at all. I mean, he's just kind of a, a, a lying scumbucket. I mean, just, just a guy that I probably wouldn't want to really hang around a whole lot because he is, he is morally corrupt. Um, he is an individual that uses lying and deception to get whatever he wants. And it seems like there is no bounds as to, to who he lies to and, and what he uh, tries to, to carry out in his deception. So he really is a dark horse because God ends up using this guy to bring about his promise, to fulfill his will and his desires. <clears throat> so Jacob's real story is not about a brave guy who through his, all of his lifetime achievements, God goes, wow, you're amazing. <laughs> Quite the opposite. He is a pitiful scoundrel that God uses to bring about his own glory. So let's set the stage for what's uh, about to transpire. If you recall all the way back, the promise was given to Abraham uh, that he would have offspring, that many nations would come, that uh, through his offspring, the world would be blessed. We hear that uh, he's going to get all this land, and, and Abraham only has one son, and the son is this same Isaac that is referred to here, uh, who's now married to Rebekah. About 35 years after this marriage of, of Isaac to Rebekah is when Abraham uh, finally passes away, and uh, he's buried with his wife, Sarah. Uh, it's a place called Machpelah. Uh, it's a pilgrimage site that uh, Christians can go to. It's a predominant Christian site for Jews and for uh, those in the Islamic faith. Uh, they go to that burial place where Abraham, Sarah, and later Isaac and Rebekah are also buried at that place. You can go there. You can see the, the burial spot. <clears throat> and so this uh, burial of Abraham uh, is interesting because Isaac and Ishmael, if you recall, got a similar story, two sons, um, and the inheritance goes to the younger son. These two, Isaac and Ishmael, actually come and they are there at the burial of Abraham. So there seems to be some reconciliation, some working through this, this dynamic that's going on. Not so much when we get to Esau and Jacob. And this really is, is set in tone, uh, the dynamic between these two at their birth. <clears throat> we hear in chapter 25 of Genesis, verse 26, that when the other twin was born, this would be Jacob, Esau was born first, they're twins, and in patriarchal law, it doesn't matter if you're born two seconds apart from each other, whoever is the firstborn is the progenitor, he is the, the one entitled to the inheritance, to the birthright, to the blessing. And, and as is born, we hear in this verse, then the other twin, Jacob, was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So you almost get this image of Esau being born, but here's this arm um, coming out and almost trying to drag Esau back into the womb to kind of stuff him back in there so that Jacob can move in front of him. He's called Yaakov. Do you know what Yaakov in Hebrew is? Ankle grabber. That's, the, that's his name, ankle grabber. So the rest of his life, he's carrying this moniker of ankle grabber that, that was shown at his birth, and he literally continues to try to be an ankle grabber the rest of his life, trying to move ahead of Esau, trying to get in front of Esau, all for his own gain. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, he says this, the vice that I'm talking about, so the vice that we're going to talk about with 
Jacob is this. The vice I'm talking about is pride and self-conceit. And the virtue that is the opposite of it in Christian morals is called humility. So self-conceit, pride is over here, humility is over here. He says, you may remember when I was talking about sexual morality, I warned you that the center of Christian morals does not lie there. It's not in sexual uh, uh, characteristics. I warned you that the center of mor Christian morals does not lie there. Well, now, he said, now I've come to the center. According to the Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost vice, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, all that, they're all mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride, C.S. Lewis writes, it was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. Pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride is the complete anti-state of mind against God. So the deception that we heard about <clears throat> that Allison read is actually not the first deception. The first one happens earlier. Um, we're told that Jacob and Esau encounter each other, and, and Esau is the hunter. Uh, he, he spends all his time at Shields and Cabela's, and Jacob is more a Sir Latab, Bed Bath & Beyond type of guy. Okay. So Esau comes in, and he's starving, and Jacob is cooking some stew. And Esau says, that smells really good. Can I have some stew? And Jacob says, well, for your birthright, sure. And Esau says, all right, give me the stew. Now, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if Esau thinks that Jacob is joking. I don't know if Esau is just really hungry. I don't know if Esau is really stupid. I don't know what's going on. But he says, okay, yeah, give me the stew. Jacob holds him to that holds him to that, and the birthright of the firstborn is transferred from Esau to Jacob. The word holds. Isaac finds out, and Isaac doesn't even challenge this. There is no challenging of this. I think this is really important for us to see. This is really important for us to understand. <clears throat> when Esau swore that oath, that the birthright would go to him, his word was spoken. His word was spoken, and the transfer was made. Let's just think about that. The spoken word as being irretrievable. You can't take it back. You can't change it. This is something we need to notice about God. In Isaiah 55, 11, God says these words. The word that comes from my mouth, God says the word that comes from my mouth will not come back to me empty. It won't come back void. But it will go out and it will accomplish the very thing for which I sent it. It will complete the purpose that I desire. When God speaks, there is power, there is strength, there is reality going out. Esau loses his birthright. Isaac is still determined to give Esau something. And so we come to the story that Allison read this morning, where, where the birthright is gone, the inheritance is gone, but the blessing of the father upon the eldest son is now going to be given to Esau. So Isaac says, go out and get me some game, come back. In the meantime, this plot develops. This is where it really gets nasty. Because Jacob doesn't come up with this idea. Did you notice that? Who comes up with the idea? Mom. Rebecca. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Earlier in Genesis, we hear that Isaac loved Esau and Rebecca loved Jacob. Do you see any potential problem in that family? Yeah, I mean, it was set from the early stage, right? So Rebekah encourages Jacob to go ahead and, and deceive his elderly father. Get this, Isaac is so old that he's going, I'm getting sick, I think I'm going to die pretty soon, and I can't see. 
So this is the guy that they go to deceive. I mean, that just kind of reveals something about Rebecca and Jacob that I find rather revolting. So they put on this, this hairy skin from a goat on Jacob because he's mama's boy and has no hair to deceive Isaac. Isaac says, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. And he blesses him. He blesses him in the midst of that deception. In our culture, <clears throat> I think we've lost some of this understanding of my word is my bond. Ever heard that phrase? My word is my bond. We've kind of lost that. Uh, people say all kinds of things. They'll, they'll say all kinds of things to kind of pacify someone. They'll say all kinds of things to get somebody off their back. They'll say all kinds of things to, to, to make sure they're saying whatever the other person wants them to hear, but then they don't really mean those words. As a result, we have a culture where a lot of times we don't know if somebody's telling the truth or not. And we get conflicting stories coming to each other, and we go, I don't know where the truth is. I don't know where reality is because I'm hearing all of this stuff, and it's all churning, and, and as a result, we don't know where we stand. We don't know what's right. We don't know what's real. We don't know what it's true. That's what deception produces is confusion and chaos and division and lies and brokenness. But here in the midst of this, here in the midst of this, is a blessing that is given. A word is spoken. And it's done so in the midst of deception and lies. And in our day and age, what would we say? Ah, it's null and void. It's null and void because they were lying. They weren't telling the truth, so we'll just, we'll set redo. Did you notice in Scripture, there's no reset? There is no undoing. The word is spoken. The word is pronounced. And the word is real. God foretold this earlier in Genesis when he said, the older will serve the younger. Now, the deception that is done, you know, everybody would think, well, you know, he got the blessing, he got the birthright, everything's hunky-dory, fine, wonderful. No, it leads to disaster. It leads to disaster for this family. As a matter of fact, Scripture says, Esau says, as soon as dad dies, I'm going to kill you. Huh? Can't undo the word, but I can get rid of you, and then I'll get all this stuff. Huh? I mean, that's wonderful brotherly bonding, isn't it? It's scary. And, and it trickles down, right? Jacob, he's got, it, later we learn, no, we're not done with Jacob today, you're going to get some from him, uh, uh, some more from him, J Pastor Lewis about Jacob next week, but he's got 12 sons, right? Aren't they just pinnacles of wonderfulness? No, they, they want to kill their brother. They sell him into... I mean, it trickles down from generation to generation. However, in the midst of this, in the midst of this lies, this deception, this destruction, this brokenness of this family, the hatred that they have for each other, guess what? God manifests his will. The promise to Abraham stands, goes right through that mess of human brokenness and sinfulness and frailty and is established. In the midst of that dishonesty, God's light shines. Remember Isaiah 55, 11? God says, my word is going to go from my mouth, and it's not going to come back to me empty, no matter what you do. It's going to accomplish the very thing for which I sent it, no matter how sinful and, and scallywag you are, and I'm going to accomplish my purpose, no matter how sinful and how deceitful and how evil you are, my word will stand. This might perplex us. I mean, it perplexes me how God could continue to work right through us and our brokenness. But God's word accomplishes what God desires. Think of Genesis, the beginning, where everything's created. How does it happen? God said, let there be light, what was there? 
There was light. God said, let there be waters. There was waters. Let there be an expanse. There's an expanse. There's there's, uh, stars in the sky, right? And then God says, let there be vegetation. Let there be animals. And, And as he says it, it comes to pass. Then God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He creates man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. His word, spoken, not undone. My word, accomplishes what I sent it to do, God says. And God speaks not with deceit and deception. God's word is filled with power and life. And when God speaks, things happen, and, and, and things don't stay the same. When God makes a covenant, it is forever. God doesn't break that covenant. It is one established on truth and reality. It's not one based on self-gain, but it's one that is embracing self-sacrifice. John 1, 1, in the beginning was what? The Word. Whose Word? God's Word. God's Word was there in the beginning, and that Word was with God, and that Word was God. God is wrapped up in that Word. Huh? He was with God from the very beginning, and through Him everything was made. Without Him nothing has been made that has been made. We heard that in Genesis. In that Word was life, and that life was a light for everybody, a light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't get it. It is a light of truth, it is a light of reality, a light of transparency, and darkness hates the truth. Lies want to cover up the truth. Deceit wants the truth not to be shown. They can't grasp it. They can't hold on to it. The Word, God's Word, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Who's that? It's Christ. Christ is that Word of God that is sent out and will not come back empty, but will accomplish the very thing for which it is sent, our salvation, our redemption, our freedom, our eternal life. Jesus, this Word made flesh, shares a Word. And he says, when he's gathered with his disciples, this bread is my body. I'm giving it to you. This cup of a new covenant is my blood shed for you. This Word that came, that took on flesh, that dwells among us is accomplishing this act of salvation for us. As we look at Jacob, we see ourselves. We don't like to admit it, but we see ourselves. If we're honest, we see ourselves. C.S. Lewis, again, a little bit later in Mere Christianity, says this. If anyone would like to acquire humility, remember self-pride, self-conceit over here, humility over here. Humility is, is, is God's word, is, is characteristic of God, this humility. If anybody would like to acquire humility, he says, I can, I think, tell them the first step. You ready? The first step is to realize that you're proud. <laughs> so the first step to humility is to say, yeah, I'm not very humble. I'm kind of lousy in that area. Uh, I look at life and I look at that it's all about me, right? The first step is to realize that one is proud. And it's a big step too, C.S. Lewis says, at least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means that you are very conceited indeed. So what can we do? Where is an area in your life where you can ask God to help you live in total honesty? Here's Jacob, willing to sacrifice everything, relationships, his family, uh, his, his friends, his livelihood, his country. He has to flee for his life over stuff, over possessions, over his pride. It's destructive. 
God doesn't want us to live lives that are destructive. God wants us to live lives that are God-honoring, that bring life and light and joy. And to do that, we need to look at ourselves. As a church body, do we reflect the promised Word of God, or do we reflect our self-centered desires? Do we reflect this gracious love to others outside the church? A guy by the name of John Burke wrote a book I just love. I read it quite a few years ago called No Perfect People Allowed. I love that. That's how their church operates. No perfect people allowed. If you think you're perfect, there's the door because we really don't need you to hang around here, right? No perfect people allowed. My Apple ID just came up and it's asking me, allow or don't allow? Now, how timely is that? That's just, that's freaky weird. Okay, quit showing off, God. That's pretty funny. Okay. So John Burke, he says, ask yourself as a Christ follower, especially if you're a leader, these questions. How much do I really love those who are not in the family of faith? How much do you really love people who are outside the church? Do I subtly consider myself better than or more together than those who are not Christ followers? Do you get kind of a little edge to you? Are non-believers attracted to my, oh, this is a big one. Are non-believers attracted to my friends and me just as the sinners in Jesus' day were attracted to him? I mean, do people outside the church want to hang around you or do they kind of go, yeah, you know, a little too goody for me. If the church is truly to be the body of Christ representing Jesus to the world, what should we be doing to be more like him? God used this dark horse called Jacob and he can use the dark horses called us. And in order for that to happen, we should confess our pride, our self-centeredness, our deceitfulness, and seek Christ's forgiveness and his love for his word to fill us, trusting in God's power, in God's divine will, and to be visible, to have it visible in our lives and in our relationship with other people. Like I said, we're not done with Jacob. We'll come back to him again next week. There's so much of him that we got to look at to learn and to see the mirror and understand who we are really, if we're honest, and what God can do with even us, just like he did with Jacob. In his precious name, amen. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that that your dedication, your love to us is, is not based upon our merit, are deserving it, but it's totally based upon your glory, your will, your desire, and that you invite us to join you, even in our brokenness, even in our sinfulness, to be redeemed, to be restored, to be your people. We give you thanks and praise, Heavenly Father, that you've called us to be the church, and we pray that we would uh, struggle with that. Um, and that your Holy Spirit would challenge us in what it means to be the church in this day and age. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the things we do and say would glorify you and would draw others to your love. We pray all this, and we join our voices together in praying the prayer that your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you.